Today, I am talking to an artist and improviser who is a trusted member of my inner circle as friend, colleague, and mentor. He's the co-founder of On Your Feet Improv for Business and the creator of Bot Joy. I'm talking to Gary Hirsch. I'm Aiden Meepom, and this is The Changed Podcast. Gary Hirsch, thank you for being on the Changed Podcast. Thank you, Aiden. This is a pleasure already, and we haven't even started. <laughs> I, uh, I I'm really excited that you're here. That you're you're game for this. Um, it's a totally different way for us to interact because we typically interact right. around work stuff. Well, we just interact we a lot, stuff. don't we? But we haven't not interacted in like official capacity where you're like, hold on a minute, I'm going to hit a record button and then we'll interact. <laughs> It's exciting. Yeah. Um, yeah. So m- most of my listeners know that in addition to being president at Art of Change, host of this podcast, I'm also a senior facilitator at On Your Feet, which is your company. Well, so you're I, also my, you're my colleague, but also you're kind of my boss. Yeah, I thought that was going to come up already. It came up really a lot quicker than I thought in this interview. I'm not comfortable with that term. However, it is accurate. Oh, t- why aren't you comfortable with that term? Oh, I don't know. Just the whole idea that I like... My own self-image isn't that I I am a boss of someone. Like even <laughs> like it just happens to be true, but um yeah, that's all. It, I will say that um I feel like uh we tend to be more collaborators on the work that we do. Yeah. At least it feels that way to me. I always feel invited to bring my best ideas to the table, which is something I value highly. All right. Well, then let's just keep the B word. Let's let's leave it there. And Z- we'll just cut. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no more boss. We're just um, colleagues. Just colleagues. Colleagues. But also, I mean, okay. Uh, there's so there's so there's so much. Okay, here's what here's what I think people will find really interesting. Um, is that in addition to doing the stuff that on your feet does, which is bringing less fear and more joy into people. You got it. You got in the right order this time. <laughs> I did it in the right order. It doesn't, it's not as effective when I say more fear and less joy. That would be a People bad, are really turned would be a, off. Wouldn't that be a bad tagline for like a consultancy? Like we will bring you more fear and less joy. You should hire us. More it, fear. It, Do worse. You know, we've been around for what? On Your Feet's been around for 20 years. I don't think we would have made it in that capacity <laughs> with that tagline. You know, I... I hang out on LinkedIn a lot and I see a lot of hustle language and there's a lot of like, do better, make more money, be yeah. more successful. And I, it's like, um, I just, there, it is the temptation to troll is really strong in me to literally have taglines like that, that are like, be less than you're capable of sure, realize well, half know, of your potential. Exactly. <laughs> it's like those, do you remember I'm um, dating myself or I don't know the age range of your listeners, but of course those anti-motivational posters that existed, it was yeah. like, you know, it's like that. It's like, and I love those things. They were great. It's like, don't bother hanging in there. And they show a cat falling or something like totally. that. Totally. Right? <laughs> <laughs> when you're out of lemons, that's, that's the time it. to go to the grocery store. Yeah, sorry, no. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, bring them back. Bring them back. Um, but in addition to all of that, I think what people uh I know that I find your visual art to be particularly inspiring. And so I wondered if you might talk a little bit about Bot Joy. Oh, gra- wow. That's cool. Thank you. Um, yeah. Because it is kind of where the joy is coming a lot from these days. Um, so Bot Joy. Bot Joy is uh, this really um, wonderful project. I say it's wonderful because it continues just to provide all this amazing, uh, amazing surprise and joy and delight for me uh, and and other people. But let's face it, I'm just talking about myself for a minute. So it just it's like a surprising thing that other like thousands of other people seem to love, too. But I still love it, even though I sort of started it. And so here's what it is in a nutshell. Um, uh, you, you mentioned on your feet, there's intersections of all my life, right? So I, sp- I split my life as a uh, consultant, I guess the way to put it. I run on your feet, which uh, works in, the, in sort of the business world. But I'm also a visual artist and an illustrator, and, and it's very near and dear to my life. And if you go to On Your Feet, you'll see a lot of illustrations. So I like to cross, do a lot of crossover between the two things in my, in my world. So about um, 
uh, 14 years ago on your feet created this notebook, which I think you probably have seen and know, but I'll describe it to your listeners that haven't seen it. Imagine just a basically a really sort of nice spiral bound with an embossed cover of hard cardboard, but beautiful green or red. And then you open up the pages and it's mostly blank pages, except every third page, and I know this because I had to wrestle with the layout, um, is a doodle, something that I've drawn with a prompt in it. And the, the, the theme, theme of this notebook and these prompts are how to co-create with the world. So for example, it might say, it might be a picture of, um, of a small child holding up a pair of glasses and the prompt might say, uh, next time you go buy a, a pair of glasses, let someone else pick them out for you, right? So that's be a, a little way to co-create with someone else. So one of these uh, doodles said the following. It had a picture of a robot and it had a picture of a little person in it. And it said, imagine if you walked around the world being followed by a giant, invisible, imaginary robot that would um, give you outrageous compliments every time you did something cool. And then it had a picture of this robot, and it was looking at this little kid, and the robot little prompt said, nice pants. So it was like giving this kid a compliment <laughs> on his pants. And it's just like one of 23 doodles in this notebook. And I just we gave them out to clients, and we gave them to about 500 people, got this notebook. And the weirdest thing happened, which was people kept – calling me back or emailing, telling me what their robot told them that day. So this outrageous compliment thing was working. Like someone would say like, yeah, it was, it was cuckoo. So this one prompt spawned a whole bunch of interest. Like, you can't believe my robot told me I was really smart in that last meeting. And I was like, oh my God, people think, you know, it's, it works. So, so really to fast track this, I decided to make the robot real. And I, uh, with a lot of process, which you can talk about some other time, I put them on dominoes. So little doodles of robots on dominoes that would serve the same function. It would give you outrageous compliments. So, so we made joy bots. And then I was like, what if it, they did some other things like gave you courage? So then I made brave bots and I donated those to kids in children's hospitals and they really grooved on it. And then this whole thing just sort of exploded. And then um, about eight years ago, I kept getting these requests because I was donating them to children's hospitals. I get these, this request to, excuse me, Gary, in an email I got from this hospital in Connecticut, I hear you donate these wonderful robots for kids and it really helps them in the hospital. Could you send us 5,000 of them, please? <laughs> That's and so many. Like, no, it is. Yes, it's so many. And who wants to say no to like a children's hospital? You know, like it was like the worst feeling to go, um, I cannot do that because I won't have a life if I draw 5,000 domino robots for you. So this was an epiphany where I decided I should invite the world to steal the idea, which is literally what I called it, and learn how to make their own and get more joy and love and bravery out in the world through art. And that is my long definition of what bot joy is. And it's murals now, and it's thousands of people making them, and there's lots of things you can do and see with them. I keep a, a joy bot in my purse. Yeah. Does it talk I love to you? It. Does it say, nice job? Is it muffled in your purse go, nice job, Raven? But you can't hear it because it's in your purse. Yeah. I mean, unfortunately, it's in my purse, so I don't know how much I'm able to really hear it. But just knowing there brings oh, yeah. me an extra level of joy because it's ever like, you know, I'm a pretty, as as you know, and as many of my listeners have probably figured out, um, I'm a pretty joyful person, mm -hmm. generally speaking. Yes. So, um, you know, I'm a real... Uh, the glass could be full any minute kind of a person. Like it's not even half full. It's like, it could be overflowing shortly. We don't know. So, you know, the, right. my need for a joy bot to instill joy within me is, is it's a pretty low it's need, low. but, but knowing that yeah. it's there, if I ever had a joy emergency, I love that. Boom. Well, it's funny. So um, those of you, you can't see this video, but I'm literally during this interview so far, I'm holding on to this joy bot which I'm now showing to the camera um, for those of you that are, would see it someday, but I'll put it, uh, I'll put a screenshot of that in the show notes. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Um, yeah. They help. I think they're helpful. And they and again, they become, it's become a real source of joy for me because now um, I just go to a hashtag me being the internet and social media literate. I figured out how to use one and I go to like hashtag bot joy and there's, two, and then everyone's projects pop up. And, but also now that pops up, which I found real joy in is that, um, there's sort of a hash, bot joy is now a, a, a uh, hashtag for a Korean um, sort of uh, K-pop band. And so I'm getting <laughs> my robots and a bunch of like K-pop Im imagery of, of uh, women and boys and girls and everyone else just sort of looking mournful and also, you know, a bit contemplative to the camera, which I don't quite get yet, but I'm going to try to figure it out. There needs to be a, a collaboration there. I would love to. I would cool. love to see that happen. Like I would, 
Mm. Out of curiosity, what number is that? Oh, right here in my hand? Yeah. Uh, This is 59,042 out of infinity. Boom. That's a lot of bots. Domino drop. Yeah. Yeah. I don't have much of a life. I just sit around and <laughs> doodle on dominoes. It, no, it's really, it's therapy. I mean, I, I mean, I mean that uh, seriously, because when I draw these robots, I line up like a hundred and then I put on, you know, books on tape or the change podcast, listen to it over and over again while I'm <laughs> drawing my dominoes and I just leave, leave my brain for a bit. And it's really nice. So it's a nice That's thing. That's amazing. To do. Yeah. That's amazing. I, so speaking of change and and the, you know that's that's a story already of going from one thing to a di- it, the whole nature of it changed just in just in doing it it grew it changed yeah, it like morphed it, it became so much bigger. Yep, by design, I think I wanted to create something that would allow for that to happen because I'm a bit of a I'm not a change junkie because change sometimes scares me, but I'm an I'm a surprise junkie so. I like good surprises in my life. And I like to like bot joy is a way to set up structure for that to happen a lot. What scares you about change? That's a big statement. Oh God. I just, okay. Yeah. Well, it's good. Well, i just, I just had, ex- I was like, okay, wait, when do I see my therapist? Is that today? Or is that, uh, <laughs> didn't I just do that? Um, well, yeah. What scares me about change is not the change itself. It's the anticipation of it. In my huh. household, we have this phrase that seems to have lived ever since sort of my daughter, who's super insightful. She's like, she'd have nightmares a lot when she was growing up and she, sleep was an issue. And then she would have anxiety about the sleep. And, mm-hmm. and so we, we dubbed it um, AA, which was not for Alcoholics Anonymous, but it was for um, anxi- anxiety and anticipation anxiety. That was it. Uh-huh. And so that kind of is prevalent in my life too. Like I'm part of that. She's, she kind of got that from me and it's kind of in our household. Like we worry a lot and we worry a lot about change coming, but we're really mm-hmm. good when it hits. So mm-hmm. maybe that's, that's helpful. Interesting. So there's that, the sort of uncertainty lies ahead and that feels anxiety producing, but then once it's there, you're like, oh, well, yeah, now, this is, uncert- what's na- now exactly. this is what's happening. Exactly. It's not uncertainty anymore. And I think that's my attractiveness, my attract yeah attractiveness to improv um, it's why mm-hmm. i am attracted to improv it's not why yeah i was losing my words there it's not why <laughs> it's why improv attra- is attracted why to I'm you attracted to improv <laughs> exactly but do you give me her show you available friday night for a show says improv yes, i am improv well, I, I love what you're wearing um <laughs> but yeah no, that's that's it i mean i think the reason i i started that whole journey is because uh, I was scared of it. And I, it was a great, fun, light way to work with it. That makes sense to me. Um, sure. It's, for what it's worth. Uh, wh- wh- when you, I know it looked like I froze, but actually I just froze in contemplation. Um, I could tell, I could tell that. And you'll probably <laughs> edit that out anyway. So I will, in fact, edit that out. That is definitely going to yeah. be cut. As no will doubt. this statement about cutting. As will this part right Unless here. Unless I decide to leave it in, editing. which will be a. <laughs> you're not. <laughs> you're going to edit out the part we talk about when we talk about editing. We'll see. I can't wait to see the final product of this. If this <laughs> makes it or not. Um, let's do this instead. I was going to follow up on that, but I think instead I want to play a game. So let's play a game. Yeah. Uh, this game is called Aiden asks you a bunch of questions and then you try and answer them as quickly as possible. Rapid fire. Okay, I got it. Yeah, it's the rapid fire round. Are you game for a rapid fire round? Am, Some of these I'm questions may the be game. familiar. I'm game for the game of rapid fire, potentially familiar questions. Okay, great. Cake or pie? Pie. Why? Oh, I, 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 I thought quick meant concise as well. Quick is concise, so let's it's, see how you do on the follow up. It's wetter. <laughs> it's a wetter experience. <laughs> the best answer i've had so far what's your favorite kind of music Ooh, um really dependent right now i can't stop listening to um every single album that boston from early 80s have cut except the other day i was locked in on musicals so there is not a right answer there it's going to depend on <laughs> something like sunspots or something i don't know what it is 
Remember when travel was a regular thing? I think it will be again someday. Imagine yeah. you get on an airplane. You sit next to a stranger. Do you put your headphones on and pretend you are invisible? Or no. do you engage in a conversation? Absolutely. I'm that guy. I'm that guy you, <laughs> if this is you, do not want to be sitting next to. Because I'm just looking for a cue to connect. And by the way, I do it now anyways, not on the airplane. That's what dogs are for. Dogs are to help you connect with other people who have dogs, which there's a lot of them out there. And so, no, I am so the connect. I'm like, hey, I read that book too. Or do you like that book? Or um, I don't know how to read. Will you teach me? Whatever it is, I'm that guy. <laughs> I happen to know that you do know how to read, though sometimes there's so I know, questions. I know, just I know. But I would even lie to connect. See? Yeah. Wow, honestly. that's impressive. If you had to choose between one favorite outfit for the rest of your life or a different outfit every day, but you never get to wear the same outfit twice, which one do you choose? That's such a great question. Before COVID, I would say, give me a different outfit every day. Now I just want those really nasty sweatpants <laughs> and t-shirt and never get on Zoom. So <laughs> let's see what happens post quarantine. Maybe I'll switch back. All right. Um, furniture arrangement. Are you a let's Ooh. rearrange the furniture often to get a fresh look in the room? <laughs> or are you a this chair has a home and it's where it will live until it dies, I die, or the house burns down? Right. See a uh, previous conversation about change. Uh, furniture stays where it is. <laughs> Has anybody ever uh, secretly rearranged the furniture and you've come home? Oh, what happened? No, what's that movie? They haven't. But what's that movie where I, your listeners will know that movie where they like you, this woman gets driven crazy because somebody comes in and just moves things really little bit every day and she can't figure out who's doing it and why. And then she loses her mind because the, the hairbrush is now to the left instead of the right. Um, so no, no one has done that. But if they do, I would probably lose my mind. I mean, there's that Twilight episode, Twilight Zone episode, where the, you know, the creatures that move things from one second to the next leave something behind, and oh. they have to go back and get it. Is that like an old Twilight Zone? Like, yeah, those old, the old ones. Oh, the I should old check ones. it. I don't know that one. Very good. Um, all right. Uh, last question. Um, read any good books lately? You know, if you call listening to books reading. That I do. Is, okay, because there's a that's controversial, and I understand why. I think your brain, there's different parts of your brain working on that. Um, here is the so embarrassing truth: I could, I have not been able to read a book really straight through for a year. I cannot read during COVID. Read, read. I've listened to over a hundred books. Whoa! Easily. That's a stark well, contrast. Yeah, because. I, it is, and it is, and I, I, it's my attention span of it. There's a lot of other people who could potentially relate to that, except our colleague Brad, who we both know who's read 70 actual books already. Paper. In yeah, paper yes. book. Um, but, uh, so, so, gosh, there are just so many. This is where I wish I could just tell you the best thing. You know what I, I've really enjoyed is I've been re-listening to A Prayer for Owen Meany, which oh. is John Irving and... Um, it's just such a delightful read. Another one is called The Highest Tide, um, which is a book uh, by an Olympia author whose name is escaping me right now, which also is similar. It's about these like sort of coming of like these young, these boys, mostly both of them are boys who are just sort of like runty and sort of picked on. And then he just kicks a major ass and they're just wonderful humans. And so I don't know that seems to be a theme happening. Nice. Thank you for playing. Aiden asks you a bunch of questions and you answer them as quickly ding, as ding, 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 possible. Ding. <laughs> Hope that was quick. And verbose. Um, as quick as any other guest has been. Okay, been good. Am I same. winning, by yeah. the way? And then we winning? Yeah, oh, sorry. Okay. That's what I meant to say. You won. Congratulations. Yes. You I have won a continued category. conversation on the Change <laughs> Podcast. <Yes>. Uh, <laughs> So we t we dipped a little bit into your thoughts about change. Um, here's what people may not know. One of the reasons that I chose storytelling as a way of looking at this broad idea of what does change mean in people's lives? What does it mean when we think about change uh, or being changed or inspiring change in other people? The reason I chose storytelling for this podcast is because of you, actually. What? 
So like, it's not like a heavy thing to lay on you. Um, yeah. Well, the whole idea of story oh, like like sort of meaning. Like pause. Yeah, I left that in there in uh, yeah. a little dramatic pause. Uh, the whole idea of story as meaning is something I learned yeah. from you, from the some of the values to action work that we do at On Your Feet. Um, but this right. idea that by telling stories, we we get a bigger picture of what a word means to a person as or a phrase. Um, and so that's one of the reasons I've Aww. chosen story. Well, I wondered actually if you might talk a little bit about the relationship between story and meaning. Sure. And, and I'd like to pay it forward the, um, the compliment or the recognition you just gave me on that idea that story is meaning because it is oh, not my do. original idea. It oh, is cool. not. And it's someone else, you know, and you will not even be surprised that this comes from this person. And I'll bet this person actually listens to this podcast. So if I don't give them the credit, they'll just be pissed off. Anyway. <laughs> um, it's from Kat Coppett. It... Oh my gosh. That's amazing. I love that. Right. It's totally from um, that. And, and we just yes-anded it like crazy with that values to action work, which I can talk about in a minute. But that's the original nugget and germ of the idea came from Kat. Um, that's amazing. And Kat has a great podcast, too. I'll put a link into the show notes to her show. Yeah, please um, do. That's awesome. That's so, yeah, so, so awesome. So uh, I was, I've been really inspired by Kat. Um, uh, I haven't talked to her in a long time, but we see each other now and then through different conferences and stuff. But early on in the work, which is we're talking early 2000s, um, I was really moved by that idea that story is meaning. So here's what I think that means. Can I say that in the same sentence? Um, when you hear a story, there's the facts and there's the feeling, but there's always this moment where you go, okay, what are, what is that trying to tell me? Or what did it tell me? Like there is, a, there's just, there's something underneath it. And the way to think about this and the way that I thought, I thought about it a lot, I started to think about it in terms of organizations and in terms of the way that, that groups of people behave, and individuals mm -hmm. too, both of them, I think. How do people behave and what's the relation to story? And so this idea of sort of values to action through story came about. And a really quick way, easy way to think about that would be, um, we got hired by the major uh, professional NBA basketball team here in Portland. This is how I could get to skirt any kind of uh, legal issue by never saying their name, but I can still say everything else. But that's not actually true. I didn't sign anything. We can just say it. But this was years and years ago. And and they were like, how can we help this organization um, connect with the community? And they hired a marketing and a PR person. And that marketing PR person said, look, I'm going to go out and just talk to the community and see what they want in a professional basketball team. So they did. And they came back and they came back with language as marketing and PR people do. And they came back with, you know what? The community wants a basketball team that is um, connected to them, that is confident, that is different than other basketball teams. So then they had this choice. They could just go ahead and make a bunch of ads that said, we are the Portland blah, 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 and we are different and confident and connected. And they could just do all the marketing, but the action or the behavior within the organization wouldn't have to change a lick. And if that's true, that becomes a disconnect because then people hear one thing, but they see behavior that's different. Mm -hmm. But these guys were smart and wonderful, and they hired us, which sounds really cocky, but I think it was a good <laughs> move. Because what we did was we went around the organization and looked for the stories that back that up. Where are you confident and connected? And where are you not? So it became looking at story as a way to verify things that you care about. And we call those stories of fact when you're sort of living that, and then stories of contradiction when you're not. And then there's stories of possibility, which are things you're not even doing, but you can sort of imagine doing and becomes a place for rich sort of white space. So this became, a, and still is, as you know, because you've been involved in these programs, an initiative, a, a pretty strong sort of cultural storytelling initiative that we use with organizations. And it really came just from that. It started with that phrase, story is meaning. That's amazing. Um, so... When I invited you on the show and I asked you to identify a story that represented this idea of change in your mm -hmm. own life, um, you know, I'll often ask people to think of a fork in the road moment or a pivotal moment or just a moment after which everything changed. And mm -hmm. for some people, they come up with 1000 stories and it's really difficult to pick. So they end up wanting to tell the story of their whole life. I'm curious mm -hmm. for you. Uh, other people, it's like they, they're, they're really struggling to come up with any stories at all. I'm curious for you, right. how easy or how hard was it to come up with the story that, that you will be sharing with us in a moment? Yeah. Well, uh, uh, the answer is I'm the first, I'm the 
former, which is there's many, 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 many that come up for me, um, which is, is, is exciting. Like just noticing that was like, that's cool. Um, look at that. That's where that happened. I mean, it's a wonderful exercise just to reflect on finding those. And when you do, you sort of pause and appreciate that they existed. And there's, there's a whole reason, different reasons why they existed. Like some of it is complete chance and coincidence, which seems to be the theme for me. Um, but sometimes it's deliberate and designed and strategized. But that was a really fun thing to do. So I found a lot of them. Awesome. Well, I'm excited to hear the story that you've chosen. Okay. Um, so Gary, if you would please share with us a story from your real life of a moment after which things changed. Here is my change story. Um, we are back in Portland, Oregon, where we are now, except it is the year uh, 19, that's correct, uh, 96, 1996, youngsters who may have no idea what that year looks like. We do, and I do. And at that moment, I had moved to Portland um, about four years ago. And Portland was this sort of ridiculous magic city for me. Um, I grew up in the Midwest and uh, Cleveland, Ohio, to be specific, and um, left as soon as I finished grad school. My mom threw a dart at a map of the West Coast and it hit Olympia, Washington. And she looked at me when I finished grad school and she said, I'm moving there, do you wanna come? That's who my mom was, she was that kind of a, she was, she's amazing. And, and I said, yeah, I'm done with grad school. I've got this degree as an art teacher. I don't know what I'm gonna do with it. I'm not even interested in teaching because I did my student teaching back in my old high school, which was the most sort of just soul crushing experience. Cause I got to be in the back room four years after I graduated with all my old teachers who were just like smoking cigarettes and just bad mouthing all the kids. They were just miserable humans. So I was like, I don't wanna be an art teacher. I'm gonna get in my car with my mom and drive to what I thought was Olympia, Washington. So we drive out to Olympia, but on the way, we get to Olympia, Olympia's like, eh. But then on the way we'd been through Portland, like, that's kind of cool. So she just hits the reverse and goes backwards down the I-5 corridor, <laughs> not really, um, <laughs> all the way to Portland. <laughs> and uh, she ended up settling in Portland and so did I. And Portland became a sort of magic city for me because like I met at the time, um, the, the person that, that I was married to for like a huge amount of time and I, I um, got my very first art commission, which was a huge project for me in Portland. Um, but I was making my living selling t-shirts. That's what I did. I hand painted these giant crazy monsters on t-shirts and I was doing great as like a weird t-shirt street artist. T-shirts have been a magical moment for me. So I'm at the Portland Saturday Market, which some of you are may, not, may or may not know. and. Um, I'm selling t-shirts on a, on a particular Saturday in 1996, except here's the, the small caveat. The rules of Portland Saturday Market are the actual artists have to be there to sell their work. You cannot hire someone else. They're very interested in that authentic moment where people get to interact with the artist. I, on the other hand, wasn't such a huge fan of that rule. <laughs> And so I had hired someone else to be me. <laughs> they were literally impersonating me. And they were selling my t-shirts underneath the Burnside Bridge on a rainy March <laughs> Saturday. I'm probably gonna get in trouble now for telling that, that part of the story. <laughs> so, so, this, so this is, I know about this happened in retrospect later, but this sort of balding British guy comes up to my t-shirt stand and gets really into the shirts. Like, this is amazing. So he uses the accent. This is amazing. That's not a good one either. <laughs> you have to help me with that. And so one of my, not one of my fortes is accent. So long story short, he's like, I really want to, he buys a bunch of t-shirts. And then he says to impersonated Gary, um, I really want to talk to the, to you about commissioning a shirt. And this is when impersonation Gary, who is a guy named John, just goes, he goes, listen, buddy, I'm not really him. <laughs> And so he gives this bald British guy uh, my card, and he calls me. This is a guy named Rob, and Rob says, "I want to talk to you about a T-shirt. I want to commission one. It's for it's got needs a spider on it. I'm part of this uh, international consul consultancy of ad planners, and we're called Red Spider. And I want to send one to everybody around the world with it. And I'm like, oh my god, this is the most sexiest thing I've ever heard in my life. And you're British, which even makes it more authentic. And so." We end up meeting and we meet, this is the pivotal moment, we meet at the Three Lines Bakery on Southwest uh, Morrison and 10th Street in Portland, Oregon. I know that's the bakery and I know that's the address because it was below my mom's office. So my mom 
this is connects everything. She decided to start a business in Portland instead of Olympia. And she was a librarian, pre-internet librarian. She would do document research retrieval. And she set up her little office there. And this was the coffee shop underneath it. So Rob and I meet. And again, he's this sort of British ad planner interested in a t-shirt. And I'm this t-shirt artist who does improv. That was my side, my sidekick gig. Uh, uh, and the reason I did improv was because I could never memorize scripts. It was my nemesis, but I really loved acting. And so I discovered improv. And I was like, oh my god, you can cheat and still do it. So I was like, let's do it. So. Rob and I start to sit down and we talk about a t-shirt. And the, uh, the pivotal moment was when he said, what else do you do besides t-shirts or drawings or paintings? And I said, well, I do this improv thing. And that was, that was the good lead. And here's the pivotal, pivotal moment, which he said, really, um, how do you do it? Can anyone do it? And my answer was, and I think this is what changed the trajectory of my life, my answer was yes. Anyone can do this. It's just the number of skills and tools that you need to learn and practice. And then he said, how about 90 ad execs from an ad agency in Chicago for in, in one month who are meeting in Tempe, Arizona to do workshops about collaboration? Now, I didn't even understand half the words he just said in that sentence. But the other pivotal moment was I said, sure, they could do that too. And so two months, a month later, we went. And it was really funny, we being, I grabbed, I was working with uh, an improv group called Brainwaves at the time, which I know you're familiar with, Aiden. And we all just went down there and we were just like, it was just such a classic sort of moment where we would be like um, walking around the grounds looking like we knew what the hell we were doing. And then we'd get in the elevator and just go like, oh my God, <laughs> they're gonna find out, we don't know shit. But we did know <laughs> shit, we knew a lot of shit. And improv was amazingly helpful. And that organization ended up just hiring us to come back and keep working. And that's when Rob decided, instead of being with the cool international consortiancy of ad planners, he would just start on your feet with me. He says, let's make this a business. And so I started, because of a t-shirt, I started a business with somebody, a Brit who lived in Spain at the time, who happened to be in Portland, uh, around improv. And I can keep going, but I think that's a good, that's good awesome. maybe good place to stop. That's a great place to stop. Thank you. Um, I love that story. I love that story so yeah, much me too. Um, because I mean, you love it for different reasons for you. It's a really personal story um, that represents mm -hmm. so much for me. I, I love it because it's an inspiring story. It's a story of a collision of ideas of the opening of the door to experimentation, to just see what happens on the other side. And I also love that it, it starts at this t-shirt booth in the Saturday market. You, my mom had a booth in the Saturday market when I was a kid. So that's right. a, a fun reference for me too. She was a, yeah. um, she created all kinds of stuff. She's an artist and designer as well. But um, yeah. So I, what do you think would have happened if you had been in the booth instead of that impersonator, Gary impersonator <laughs> named John? <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, think about it. Probably, it probably would have, I would have gotten a really kick-ass t-shirt commission. That's it. And that might have been it. That's probably Because you wouldn't have been would, in a coffee that shop. That might have been it. Right. And and also, also um, the art itself would have dominated. It's like we were surrounded by it, right? It was like every, the offer, as we would say in our biz, was just super strong. And I would have been like, oh, let me show you this one. And you could have this kind of color. And I think I would have just really accepted the offer of t-shirt. And yeah. I'll bet you he never would have gotten to the what else do you do question. I think that's probably true. Yeah. But I who knows? God. We'll never know. Uh, no, not until Back to the Future becomes real. <laughs> then we could know. I mean, if you could go back in time, would you go back to that moment and find out? Or would you go back somewhere else? Oh, no. I, no, I could care less about that moment. No, I'd go back yeah. somewhere else. <laughs> I really that seems like know. a pretty great moment. It does. But no, I, I'd really take advantage. Like it was like that, that, you know, you get one wish from the genie. I would uh -huh. be, it was like that. You could go back to one place in time. You should put this in your flash questions. Um, if that were true, I want to go back to see if aliens built the pyramid. Nice. Yeah. That's right. That's what I want to see. <laughs> that seems like pretty significant. <laughs> yeah. That'd be, that's a good one to go back in time and find out. I have no idea if I could go back in time and find out the answer to anything. I don't know. I don't know. It's like, it's, it's too many choices. Like I, 
Yeah. When I look at a menu, my secret to ordering off of the menu is I just let my eyes fall on one thing and I go, would I eat that or not? And then if the answer is yes, I just order it and then I don't have to read anymore. So this idea of like, I could go anywhere in time. I'm like, oh no, yeah. it's too no, much. I, it is super overwhelming. Yeah. That's why you have to go. I think for me to be able to access that at all, I'm with you. I totally agree. To be access to you, it's like, there's really only two things I think that are, that are like the bigger all encompassing question, which is like, what happened before the big bang? I'd like to know that mm, please. Mm, and mm. have we been visited by aliens? That seems to me trumps anything else. That would, <laughs> I love that would it. Show up. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm really just struck by this image of you in the coffee shop with Rob and mm -hmm. him being like, what else do you do? That's just such a, a cool, simple moment that just unlocks so much. Well, I, it, when you... yeah, yeah, it is. And we've, by the way, Rob and I are, as you, you know, Aiden, but others wouldn't. So this is like 96. We are still, I talk to him all the time. Like he's no longer really involved with On Your Feet, but he's a huge supporter of it. He's got his own amazing thing going right now that I'm part of. And um, we talk about this moment a lot. Like we have real, it's literally a chapter of a book. And it is this, the, the first chapter of Everything's an Offer, which is a book that he wrote and I illustrated, which you can't find anymore because it's no longer in print. So don't bother to put it in your notes, um, is, <laughs> is the whole chapter is, the, is this story. So we've really analyzed it. And here's the thing that I think was cool about it. It is it's like a, a mirror of the behaviors of improv that we teach now anyway. So Rob's was just he was just curious. He was like, I'm going to get more curious about this person. He does T-shirts. He seems like he's cool. He's not. It doesn't seem like he's a serial killer. I'm going to spend more time with him. And so he got curious about me, and I accepted the offer. I wasn't like, no, oh, I forgot it. I don't want to tell you. You know. So I was like, well, I do this thing. And then it was a yes and fest because he was like, really improv? Tell me about it. Well, da 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 da. And then he just accepted it with this crazy leap of of faith, which was, do you want to come to Arizona? Like, who does that? That's huge. Who does that? That is just bonkers. It's huge. Yeah. Yeah, that's really That is pretty cool. Huge. Do you, th I mean, do you think those are the lessons that the people take from this story? Those like improv lessons? Mm. Do you think there's something else to be said about adventure or, I don't know. Yes, I do. Sure. Well, you know, I, um, I've had somebody ask, like, weirdly and this again it's like the boss word like i have had other people in my life ask me for advice a lot, not a lot but on occasion which again it's like it sort of raises my status which i'm not sure i'm super comfortable with but when i i have the same answer to that which is um make the call right so if somebody if like at a party and somebody goes um you know what um you should really call da 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 because they know a lot about blah 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 most mm -hmm. people don't make that call. Most people don't go like, and you'd make the call. I totally. I did make, make the call. Yeah, that's how we. Make, are connected. Right, that's how we met. You made the call. So you're a great. Make the call. I made the call. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So I think it's it's like when Rob Rob made the call by pursuing. He didn't have to. He's like, okay, the t-shirt's mm -hmm. cool, but I'm in Portland. And I got distracted. He did. He made the call. Literally, I made the call by showing up at the thing. Like. It is a yes. It's other ways of saying just see yes and see what shows up, which, yeah, I think that's the big lesson. I love that. I, you know, I've had um, conversations with people about this idea between um, luck or not luck, like lucky, not lucky. Mm -hmm. um, I had someone once tell me many years ago, they were like, you're just a lucky person. Mm -hmm. And I'm an unlucky person is what they said. And I maybe that's true what do i know i don't know but here's what i think i'm doing that's different than what they were doing i think i make the call so i'm paying attention yeah. and when there's an offer i i jump on the offer and i build on it so the you know the way i ended up being involved with on your feet at all was enough people in a row said you should talk to gary <laughs> and that, i mean yep. and i was like okay so i sent you a one sentence email that said shana and julie and I don't somebody else, Eric, maybe suggested that we have a conversation. Do you want to get a cup of coffee? And you were like, yeah, that sounds great. That was how that all started. <laughs> and then the next thing I knew, you were like, why don't maybe you just do your work in our office? Just... <laughs> right. Yeah. Which was another weird. I mean, being the operative is just the coffee part. Maybe that's the commonality. Maybe <laughs> you just have to have coffee with people. 
It's not make the call. But no, you're right. But it's very, it's make the coffee. But you're right. It it is a similar, it is a very similar. I think that pattern, if I had to really think about it, that pattern exists a lot in my life when it comes to, as you would call maybe luck, or I might call just success. I don't call it luck. No, you don't. You don't. But but I think people do. Yeah. I don't think it is. I do not. No, luck is just tells you like it's out of your hands. And I think you get, you get in position for luck. It's like you get into the position to be available for it. And I think there's a difference there. Um, I do too. I think, I think it feels, it feels lucky. I feel blessed. I feel lucky um, when cool things happen in my life. But I think, you know, it feels like work to make the call, to make the coffee (laughs) feels like work, but Actually, the reward for just taking that small step is like a really big, easy, wonderful reward, whereas that small step can yeah. sometimes be the obstacle people are unwilling to overcome. So this could open up a major conversation, which I don't think you even want on your podcast right now. But just remind me for later, we should talk about the uh, UNESCO. So United Nations now has a new initiative, which is to help people get more future literate, to just be more available to be think about the future in a way that is healthy. And um, I just learned a ton about this, which in- completely informs what we're talking about. So let's have coffee, oh, the man. bakery sometime. Let's do and it. I'll, I'll dive into that with you and you can follow up with something on the air if you want sometime, but it's pretty amazing. I would love that. Yeah. Yes. I definitely want to talk about that. I think people are going to be so curious. I'm going to have to edit out this whole thought. So it's just <laughs> make people feel like they're missing out. Just edit um, it because, out. <laughs> and this is going to be a 15 minute episode. <laughs> cool. <laughs> probably just as good, just as well a future future of literacy is that what it is no it's to help people no, be literate about, about thinking the about the future. future yes yes yeah <laughs> yeah yeah i i love Actually, that you know, I, mean, again, I definitely want you, to talk about that if you keep this in if you keep, do keep this in this is uh, this is from this is from robert point and it's another gift that rob gave me which has introduced me to someone who's thinking about this stuff so everything comes I think around that's, I think that's awesome. I think there's this tendency to want to think about the future of whatever, but I'm constantly struck by how the future is already happening. We're in it right now. Nope. Crazy. Right now. No, it's now. now. No, well, it's actually, it's going to be, but it's now. That's the They Might Be Giant (laughs) song, of course, which is, you know, this one, right? The, The They Might Be Giant song, which is, you're older than you've ever been. But now you're even older, and now you're <laughs> even older, and now you're even older. You're older than you. You get it. Yeah. I love They Might Be Giants. Me it's too. the best music in the world. That's it. That, um, to go back on my answer, They Might Be Giants <laughs> is my favorite band and my favorite music. Um, do you think that uh, when it comes to change, do you think that those moments – like? You identified this moment, but you weren't terrified in that moment of the possible change of going to have a cup of coffee with person. But you were saying no. before that, like the thinking about possible change causes anxiety. Can you connect mm-hmm. the dots for me a little bit? Yeah, that's cool. That's great. I don't know. I'll, do, I'll talk and maybe something smart will come out of my mouth around that. Let's see. <laughs> well, here's, here's what I think about that. I, saying So this is the idea of habit and familiarity around change, right? So going to have coffee with somebody to talk about a t-shirt does not scare me because I had done that before in some capacity somewhere. I probably not coffee, maybe not t-shirt, but you put them all together. It's kind of the same idea. But as soon as, as soon as he says, would you go to Tempe, Arizona and run a workshop with a bunch of ad consultants? I say yes, but my heart is going fum, 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 fum. <laughs> like that starts to get scary. So okay, that makes sense. That's the difference there. I'm not. I'm not afraid. Like, if I was afraid of every change, I'd never leave the house. I think let's let's. It's about, in particular, I think there's a nuance here. What is what is the kind of change that you know is good for you but scares the shit out of you? Mm. That's the thing, that is a, I think an interesting space to be in. That's like, mm, wow, pull, push me, pull me, like a Doctor Do little <laughs> thing. So, yeah. Well. Well, as we're bringing things to a close here, what are some final thoughts you'd like to leave people with after listening to these stories in this conversation? And I have one mm. one more thing we might do after you answer okay. this question. Well, I don't, I, honestly, I think we've hit them. So I, I'd be dr- trying to drag out 
trying to sound smart, but it's like make the call, I think is a great one. Uh, I think um, get yourself in position for great luck versus just hope that it'll show up, I think is another really good one. I think um, don't be afraid of accepting the offer beyond what you think, beyond your imagination, really. Like when you say yes to going to Tempe, Arizona with a bunch of ad execs, I can't, I didn't even picture what the hell that was. I couldn't even imagine it. So, and now I do this, been doing it for the last 20 years. So let's try those three. Thank you for being on the show, Gary. I think, I mean, I always enjoy talking to you, but I'm really excited to get to share your thoughts and stories with others. And, um, and so, yeah, I really appreciate you being here. I love talking with you too, Aiden. You, you uh, bring joy to my face every time we chat. <laughs> Here's a little joy in your face. Boom. Damn. Thank you, Aiden. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So today, instead of just me giving you my final thoughts, I thought maybe Gary and I could share something that you can take and use. And in this way, you get a bonus story. So that's exciting too. So a little bonus, uh, since we've talked so much about story and improv, I think it would be fun for us to play a little bit of a story game. And this is something that you had introduced before we hit the record button. You were like, what if we played a little color advance? So, oh, yeah. Uh, so here's how Color Advance works, and you can play at home. Uh, not with this particular story, because you'll be listening, but try this with your friends, your family, your loved ones, with whoever. Try this at work. The way it works is, when you want more detail, you say the word color, as in color in that moment. And when you want the story to move forward in action, you say advance. It's really that simple. So Gary, I'm going to ask you, since you're the guest and you're telling stories, I think it'd be fun to hear a story, since you have thousands of pivotal moments to choose from, from early in uh, <laughs> young Gary Hirsch's life. Oh, oh. sure. I, I, you may be imagining this story because you may know this story, but I'm happy. To, I don't know. Is it, is I don't, know all, I don't know all your stories. What oh, was that? Know. No, you know all my stories. Uh, What's wrong with I you? know that uh, well, story. All it was, right. It was, it was a pub. Yeah, I'll yeah. tell that story because I okay, can't think great. of anything else. Um, all right, here's a story. Uh, we are back in, let's see, how old am I? 72, 1972. I'm seven years old. You now know how old I am. Um, Advance. And having terrible nightmares every night during this time in my life. Color. And these nightmares would be like, you're, I'm laying in bed where I actually am sleeping, but I'm actually dreaming that I'm laying in bed. And then like the door of my bedroom breaks open and a giant hand starts to wiggle inside my room Ooh, and, grab, and grabs me. Um, waking up with from this terrorizing nightmare, I go running into my parents' room and I wake my father. Color. And uh, my father, uh, Eugene, uh, physician and uh, peace activist and concert pianist and poet, uh, groggily wakes up and leads me by the hand. Advance. Uh, when the cinnamon toast gets into the toaster in the kitchen, he settles me down and hands me paper and pencil and says, you should draw these nightmares that you're so- Color. Uh, it's not, I don't hesitate, it's very easy. I can see these things, giant monsters with teeth that are just dripping out of their mouths and huge uh, maniacal eyeballs. And um, this monster, that eats me, but inside of its belly is a graveyard where I'm chased by zombies, and I draw all of these scenarios as we go. And, Advance. Um, this happens over and over again <laughs> throughout the, the evenings of this year, until one evening, uh, my dad said, uh, well, this evening, now I'm just going to make it up because I don't actually remember what happened this particular evening. But let's say one evening, a particularly terrible dream, and I'm drawing. And oh, I do know this. My father and I start to co-create the names of these monsters. So we're sitting there, and he's, he's like, uh, that's cool. What should we call it? I go, you tell me. So he writes down, like, lamppost monster because its its eyeballs look like a lamppost and stuff. So one evening, we're starting to co-create, and he says to me, you know, if you draw these things, you create them, which means if you erase them, you can make them go away. <gasps> Advance. You know, he hands me this eraser and I start to erase my drawings. That month and the month subsequent, my nightmares start to diminish. They start to slowly go away as I erase the monsters until I don't have nightmares anymore by the end of that year. And the moral of the story? Always keep an eraser in your pocket. 
you can make things go away. (laughs) (laughs) And that's how you play Color Advance. Also an amazing story. I love that story. Um, You can um, enjoy another version of that story in, uh, in Gary's TED Talk, which will be linked in the show notes for this episode. Thanks, Aiden. Thank you, Gary. That was fun. That was great. Loved it. I want to hear from you. Have thoughts, feelings, sarcastic remarks, or a story to share based on listening to this episode? Help me keep the conversation going. www.facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash change hub. Special thanks go to my family for their love, support, and patience. To all of the amazing Changed Podcast Patreon page members who I couldn't do this without. The Art of Change Skills for Life and Patreon member producer, Dr. Rick Kirshner. Thank you to Gary Hirsch for all of his thoughts. Thank you to you for listening to them. This is The Changed Podcast. I'm Aiden Nepom, and I wish you the kind of experiences in life you're excited to tell stories about. Music